welcome again, and we're glad you've chosen to join us on this beautiful summer morning. If you're joining us as a member of our TV audience, we thank you as well for joining us. You are an important part of this ministry, and we hope that this uh, service is a blessing to you as well. If you're visiting with us for the first time, if you'd indicate your presence to the ushers as they make their way to the back of the sanctuary, they have a small information packet and a gift for you. Again, we hope to see you here again soon and often. For those sitting here in the sanctuary along the center aisle, if you'd take the, the maroon friendship pan, pads and uh, sign your name and pass it up and down the pew so that we may acknowledge those that are worshiping with us this morning, uh, that would be most appreciative. A few announcements uh, that are also in your bulletin uh, tomorrow uh, afternoon. There's a woman's study with Shirley Mahood at Mary Bell Mitten's house. Uh, so you could look at the information in the bulletin and contact Mary Bell if you have any questions regarding that event. <clears throat> this coming Saturday, August 3rd, is an, uh, another opportunity for us to build a ramp for a needy family or needy persons within our community. Uh, the ramp, this ramp is going to be built here in Endicott. <clears throat> On August 12th, Monday, August 12th, um, Kelly Devine will be having a CPR class here at Central. Uh, you can s sign up outside the church office and uh, contact Kelly if you have any questions with regard to CPR certification. And the summer Sunday school class, an update to what's in the bulletin, it will not meet at the Vestal Rail Trail. It's gonna meet here in the sanctuary after the service. So again, summer Sunday school today uh, will be here uh, after the service. And now we have a minute speaker from our TV ministry, Carl Molnar. Good morning. Uh, it's funny, it's, I'm much more comfortable behind the camera than in front of it. Uh, some of you may have uh, seen an email from the office or you, in the bulletin you saw a note about Time Warner Cable. We just want to very briefly let you know that if you, had tr if you have trouble finding Channel 4, our TV ministry, there are ways of, of getting it. Time Warner has basically been part of a 15-year-long plan to turn television into a digital format. Well, they've done that with their public access now. But the good news is uh, if you have a newer TV, you can make it work. If you have an older TV, you can make it work. In fact, Time Warner will give you one of these handy dandy uh, free TV adapters so you can get the digital signal. Comes with a remote control for those of you that don't have enough remote controls at home. And it even comes with the batteries. So that's a really good thing. If you don't have Time Warner, I want to remind you that you can also watch us on the Central's webpage. We have a lot of our uh, service is now on, on the video section of our webpage. So if, if you're out of town or if you don't have Time Warner itself, you can watch us online. Um, there are other ways of getting past this digital divide. For the guys in the room, this is the perfect time to buy the 72-inch screen. <laughs> if you're still looking at that old one, it's time for a new one. I uh, also like to mention, just in passing, we've been working, Bob and Derek and I and the video, uh, video ministry have been looking at ways to improve the way we use video projection. You know, we've done a lot of really nice things with the confirmation class and some of our mission work. We're looking and trying to figure out how we might use video projection a little bit better. More on that to come. Thank you. Thank you, Carl, and to the TV ministry and the wonderful things that you do for the church. Again, the announcements that we covered earlier are in the bulletin, as well as many others as in the church calendar. We invite you to take that home and participate in as many of those events as you're called to do. Our first reading this morning is from Jeremiah 17, verses 14 through 17 and it can be found in the Old Testament on page 719 in your Pew Bible. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. See how they say to me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I have not run away from being a shepherd in your service, nor have I desired the fatal day. You know what came from my lips. It was before your face. Do not become a terror to me. You are my refuge in the day of disaster. Let us now join in a time of prayer. 
O holy God, light of light, word of words, peace of perfect peace, we praise you and we thank you for the faith we have, for the hope we can always rekindle, for the love we experience in all creation, and for the spirit that dwells in the world and in each of us. Bless us. that in it we may affirm the grace and wonder of with you, in and through Jesus Christ. Amen. Was that? And Jeff, that was, that was lovely. Um, actually, last week, uh, Suzette and I celebrated uh, 36 years together. And... Um, Thank you. She's actually done really well, given what she had to, to start with. Um, it's the first time I think I've, I remember hearing that song. Hopefully, I won't have to wait another 36 to hear it again. Uh, in just a, a few moments, Tom is going to come up and lead us through our list of, of prayer concerns. But I wanted to mention one in particular. Uh, you may have noticed that Steve Heiss's name is on the list. Uh, longtime Central members will remember Steve as one of your fine associate pastors. More recent members at Central will remember him from back in the spring when we had the Lucas Jackson celebration and Steve offered the message that day. Uh, Steve is on there for an issue related to gay marriage, uh, a very intractable emotional issue that uh, resonates with society and within our denomination. While gay marriage is now legal in approximately 25% of the states, it is still against church law for United Methodist pastors to officiate at such weddings. Steve, a month or two ago, wrote a letter to the bishop, a very public letter, in which he said that he had officiated at at least two gay weddings and would again when the opportunity presented itself. It's a stand of conscience uh, similar to Martin Luther King when he would break a law and then accept the consequences. Uh, a formal charge has been filed against Steve and the, it's, it's a long complicated process of hearings and the potential for a trial and so forth and that begins on Thursday of this week. So regardless of how we feel about the issue, my hope and prayer is that you would be in prayer for Steve because he has essentially put his career in jeopardy. One of the punishments possible in this is that he could lose his ordination. It uh, doesn't have to be that. It could be something else if people want to be creative. But again, regardless of how we feel on this issue, I hope you would be in prayer for him, be in prayer for our annual conference, and be in prayer for our denomination. These trials cost a lot of money. They take a lot of energy time, money, and energy that could be spent serving the poor and spreading the word of Christ. My hope and prayer is that we can find our way through this issue of justice uh, in a way that, that we can indeed serve Christ as we are called to. Thank you. Who is above us and in us and through us, we come to worship you with a, a fresh consciousness of your reality and your presence. We want to move beyond just talking about you. We would not argue, but we would experience you now. We praise you for your never-ending presence, which surrounds us with your love, strengthens us in our weakness, and guides us in our perplexity. We bless you for your patience with us in spite of our willfulness, for the sense of providence in our lives, and for all the assistance and direction of your spirit's leading. You who brooded over the world at its beginning and brought order out of chaos, brood over us now and bring order from the chaos among nations. Encourage every impulse to peace. Empower those who lead and those who follow to build a world that does not rest on force but upon concern for the common good of all. Deliver us from doubt and disillusionment, from cynicism and rebellion, and though we may not see all things clearly, help us to see some great things plainly, 
that we may live by them. Draw us together as a community of tender and forgiving people. Be where people hurt, we pray, where people are healing. Bind the broken hearts, help mend the torn bodies and ease the disturbed minds. Especially on our hearts this morning, we pray for Kathy, for Dave, for Sarah, for Steve, for Butch, for Kim, for Ruth. We mourn with the families of Larry and Ed and Chuck that in their time of loss, the families may find your presence with them. But even in the midst of the things that distress us and concern us, we find the moments of joy and we celebrate them, especially this day, the coming of Chloe and Sophia, newborns into this world already gracing us with their joy and their presence. As it is for us this day, we know it is for countless many around the world and in our community. Help us to remember them when we remember you as we pray together the prayer that Christ taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Next Sunday is communion. Then I'm gone for two weeks of vacation. And when I return, it's going to be time for us to shift our focus already to the fall and the year ahead. It uh, hardly seems possible. But for today, we savor this final look at this book that has led to so many marvelous images, religious and sacred, but also so much misuse and misunderstanding. We've looked at some terrible, terrifying, frightful scenes, and we've come to see that, frankly, they're overrated, in the sense that there's nothing to be frightened about. They're really, at base, all signs of hope. Difficult, complicated images, hard for us to fully grasp, sometimes because of, of the distances of time and culture. But, but we've unraveled them to some degree. Well, all of that is behind us. And I said we can savor today's reading because after all of that anxiety and angst from the other weeks, after all of the tensions and all the intensities, after all the trials and all the tribulations and traumas, today is a blissful walk in the park. Save for a little blip near the end of the book, this is a pleasant walk in warm sunshine. It's a leisurely walk along a neighborhood street as the evening sun slips to the horizon. Actually, what it is, it's more like a morning stroll along a boardwalk or beach as the morning star, as the sun, rises to bring warmth and light to a new day. Today's passage is the climax, the ending to the book of Revelation. Now, since Revelation is the last book of the New Testament, it's also the climax of the New Testament. And since the New Testament is the final testament in the Bible, these words are the climax to the whole Bible. Now that's not by accident. Among people who study the Bible, there's an entire field dedicated to figuring out how and why the Bible is organized as it is. Which books are included among the many that were around and why are they in a very particular order? It's a very small, nuanced field of biblical scholarship. You know, we joke about how we have uh, foot doctors. Uh, we have uh, doctors who concentrate on the left foot, doctors who concentrate on the right foot. Okay. Well, this is, this is what uh, 
uh, the, the happens in the field of Bible study too. So the words that we're focusing on today, some one or some ones deliberately picked them to close out and round out all of Christian scripture. And therefore, they're worthy of special note. Now, they were written originally, read originally, and spoken originally in a particular context, which is no surprise because no religion exists in a vacuum. I mean, any religion or faith always does its thing in the midst of the world around them. It's like us today. We've talked about this before. How the United States used to be, well, used to claim it was a very Christian nation. The Christian faith was pretty much the one that mattered. Christian beliefs, Christian practices ruled the day. You know, stores were closed on Sundays, you didn't go to movies, and all, all those sorts of things. Other faiths, religions were tolerated, maybe. We knew they were there, but they weren't that important weren't considered to be that important. But now, we are sensitive to people of all faiths, and even those with no express religious faith. We live in a multicultural, multi-religious world. This rankles some, it troubles some, because frankly, it is more work. To be sensitive to somebody else is more work than just thinking about yourself. But I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. We Christians now find ourselves in the, in the situation where we have to make our case in a world filled with competing voices. We can't just say, well, because I said so, and that's the end of the discussion. We have to explain the how and the why. And that's good for us. It's good for us to work at not only what we believe, but to know why we believe it. So, same for the first Christians. Their world was awash with any number of other religions and beliefs. Uh, Judaism, the so-called uh, mystery religions where you would kill the animals and not, not to be unsightly in church, but, you know, you would drink the blood to get the properties of those animals. And, I mean, we could go on and on. Um, there were people who said they were prophets. There were people who said they were soothsayers. And in the midst of all that comes this new tradition, followers of the way, of this Jesus. Because they were new, they were very low on the totem pole, if you will. And what further complicated it was because they believed in only one God, the true God of heaven, creator of heaven and earth, and so on. Because there, they could not then accept the Roman secular leader, Caesar, as a God in any way, shape, form, or manner. And we discussed last week or the week before then how their very lives and livelihoods became at risk then. If you were not willing to confess Caesar as Lord, it was very difficult to get a job. Your neighbors were always spying on you to see how you were being, how you were working and living against the Roman government. We're fortunate that here in the United States we don't have that problem. But we still have the questions about how to make the Christian voice heard in a world that's more and more fixated on self-promotion, selfishness, and ruling by clubs of intimidation and manipulation. <clears throat> John's solution to this dilemma in the book of Revelation is very simple. Some might say it's simplistic. Some might say it is naive. His answer is, it's the way of faith. How does he open this passage? He says, look, these words are trustworthy and true. God's angel was sent to show us what will take place. God's angel, I know you're a sharp bunch, you know who he's talking about. It's Jesus. Jesus was sent to us. We should keep the faith that Jesus Christ is who we confess he is, the Son of God, the God who came to live among us to show us the way. 
And John continues. Now, detractors will say, oh, yes, your Jesus came, but your Jesus was killed. That is true. Jesus was killed. But the essence of the Christian, Christian confession is that death did not have the last word. Death was not the end. There was that thing, that thing called resurrection. God is the God of the living. God is the God of the dead. And so, says John, look, Jesus is the root, the descendant of Jesse and of David. Jesus is the one we have been looking for since the days of old. That was that Jeremiah passage that, that Linda read earlier in the service. Where is the word of the Lord? You are my refuge in the day of disaster, he writes. Jeremiah was looking for that day when God would come and be a welcome presence. And John says, here it is. Here it is. Jesus is that root and that descendant. With Jesus, Jesus becomes the bright morning star. In Jesus, with Jesus, come light and life. In Jesus, with Jesus come God's full grace and graciousness. Let everyone who is thirsty come, he says. Let anyone, anyone who wishes, take the water of life as a gift. Any and all are welcome. Any and all are welcome. The circle of God's encompassing care is infinitely large infinitely large. As I wrote those words, the words from the great hymn, I'll firm a foundation, came to my mind. Fear not, I am with you, and be not dismayed. I am your God and will still give you aid. I'll strengthen you, help you, and cause you to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. Surely, says John, Jesus is coming soon. At the end time, yes, but also present now in us as the body of Christ, as we live as God in Christ would have us to live. The morning star, capital M, capital S, isn't just the sun. The morning star is something more significant. Here, now, a bright, shining beacon. John says, rejoice take heart and take hope. We are about something noble, holy, and good. Toward the end of this passage in, in Revelation, there's a, a phrase about plagues on anyone who, who, who adds or takes away from the words of this book. That the scholars believe that's really kind of a, a tongue-in-cheek side note to the scribes who, who had to uh, write the book because remember, this is long before Gutenberg. There's no printing press. A scribe would have to sit and, and actually rewrite the book of Revelation to, to, to have another copy. And so John is saying to the scribe, you know, please get this right. Okay? Don't take anything away. Don't add to the book. Please get this right. For the rest of us, the closing of Revelation are words of benediction and blessing. Assurances that God, in, through Christ, is in the world. And God is not in the world to exact revenge, hurt, or harm. God is not looking to punish mistakes. Actually, the consequence of mistakes usually are their own, their own punishment. No. God's greatest will, God's greatest wish in the world is to see creation creatures and the beings in it, whole and happy and fulfilled. God is a refuge in time of trouble. John is saying essentially, let's not be about the things that divide and separate, but let us be about the holy things that bind us together and show God being present in the world. 
Now, if you'll allow me, I want to take a, a little bit of a side trip here for just a moment, but it will come back and, in theory, connect with, with what I've been talking about to this point. Some months ago, actually, I think it was back in the fall, I, I uh, offered some thoughts in, in a sermon where I talked about Robert Frost's poem about fences. I'm not going to ask you if you remember that because, you know, just, I'm going to remind you. Uh, he was talking about fences. Good fences make good neighbors. You know, we've heard that phrase. And in, in telling that story, I talked about the home where Suzette and I live now in, in Binghamton, where on one side of us we have neighbors with a very surly, unpleasant, loud, barking dog. There are other words I could use, but we're in church, I won't use them. I don't use them anyway. So we have that on one side. So we put up a fence, and we get along a whole lot better with the neighbors over there now that that fence is up. On the other side of us, just, I mean, a stone, you, you could flip a tiddlywink from our side yard, and you would hit these, the patio of the other neighbors. That's on the side of the house where I have a little garden strip where I like to put on my grubby clothes and go out and garden. Nobody needs to see that when they're trying to enjoy their patio. Okay? So we put up another fence on that side so they could have a more pleasant surroundings. And the new neighbors in there thanked me for that profusely a couple of weeks ago. They're grateful for that fence. So... Uh, my point in the sermon was, it's good to have walls because it keeps potential problems to a minimum. Now, a number of people after the sermon commented on that. They liked the message. They liked the reference to the poem. And there were even a couple of people who said, oh, you know, I've read that poem. I liked it. Nobody, nobody before or since has called me out for misusing the poem. Nobody has called me out for misusing the poem. Now, I've been called out for sermons that were too long. I've been called out for sermons that were too short. Uh, well, actually, I haven't been accused of having too short sermons. Once, once in a while. I have been accused of, of having sermons with not enough examples. And I've been accused of having sermons with too many examples. Well, actually, I've never been accused of having a sermon with too many examples. Um, I've been accused of, of being political, partisan on one side or the other of issues. No, I'm not really political. I am theological. The difficulty is that sometimes the implications of our theology are so clear, are so clear that they're perceived as political, but they are theological. But the point is, I've never been called out for misusing an example. Because if anyone who had read the poem and listened to what I said about it that morning, they would know that either I never read the poem or I misused it completely. I'm not looking for criticism. Don't, don't take that the wrong way. But it's just kind of scary that nobody, nobody caught me on that. So I decided sometime later, you know, let me actually read this poem, which I did. And interestingly, it's called Mending Walls. It doesn't say anything about fences in the title. It's called Mending Walls. And it has to do with Robert Frost. He and his New Hampshire neighbor, they're out in farm country with fields of trees. There are no cattle. They just have trees. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with that part of New England, Massachusetts, Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, and, and Maine. One of the things that they grow really well in that area is rocks. So you take the rocks out of your field one season and you come back next and you've got more. Somehow the rocks have been able to reproduce and there are more and more. And what they did was they used the rocks to make the stone walls. Yeah, maybe waist high, uh, if that. So. Uh, he, he, Frost is saying, every spring my neighbor and I, we go out and we rebuild the wall. Because in the winter, this is before global warming, so they had real winters, you know, the frost would heave the ground and the walls would fall down. And, and the two of them would come out 
and some of the rocks fell on one side, some fell on the other, and, and together they'd pick up the stones and rebuild the wall. And Frost asked the neighbor one spring, he said, why are we doing this? I mean, it's not like we have cattle, you know, or sheep we're trying to keep enclosed. It's, it's just the, the, the orchards here. And the neighbor says, well, you know, we've always done this. My daddy, my daddy always rebuilt the wall every season. And so if my father did it, I'm going to do it too. It's just what we do. So they rebuilt the wall, stone by stone. Here's the point. They worked together. They worked together to rebuild the wall. And now my interpretation of what's going on. I'll, I'll have to own this part. As they worked, they talked. And as they talked and built up that wall that was a dividing line between them, they actually were building up a relationship between the two because they were very good friends. They got along well. They didn't need a wall to, to keep them friendly with one another. But it was in the act of working on that object that, that separated them that actually drew them together. This past week, I forget if it was in Friday's newspaper or Saturday's, I think it was Saturday's, was a story about the Children of Abraham event that was recently held. Children of Abraham, you may remember, Christian Jews, Muslims, getting together to talk about our common heritage as children of Abraham in the Bible. And as Muslim brothers and sisters were getting ready to end Ram their Ramadan fast and begin to eat again, the Children of Abraham gathered and and they ate together and they talked about um, what is different about their faiths. But as they were talking about their differences, they were building up camaraderie, mutual respect, and appreciation and admiration. So John says to his Christian brothers and sisters, look, we are in this world that's varied and different. There's a lot of things we don't understand. There are a lot of things we don't like. There are a lot of questions about the where's and the why's and the how's and the who's and the what's and so on. But we need not fear. We are not stumbling around in the dark, just victims of circumstances. We are walking in the brightness of the morning star. Jesus, who showed us and still shows us how much God loves creation and the creatures in it. Jesus, who lived for us, who died for us, who rose for us, and still reigns with God for us. Jesus is the example of God's way of peace, grace, love, justice, inclusion. I raise the question to myself, what has changed in our day since the time of when Revelation was written. In some ways, a lot has changed. We know now that the world is round. Most of us believe that anyway, that it's round and that it revolves. It's not flat and stationary. We know that illnesses are caused by germs and viruses. They're not caused by evil spirits. We know that crops grow or don't grow because of the care taken in planting and cultivating and as a consequence of the weather. It's not because the god of the corn or the god of the wheat is angry with us. So in many ways, a lot has changed. But in many ways, very little has changed. We live in a world filled with differences. Some we find exciting, some we find interesting, Others we find disturbing and scary. We live in a world of uncertainty with forces who would use that uncertainty to threaten, coerce, and cajole. We also live in a world where God and Jesus Christ still reigns over all. And that's where we are to put our faith and our trust, to live by grace and in the confidence that we are in God's hand. And in following the way of Christ, we become an example 
of a better, a more excellent way, a way that leads to life abundant, holy, and joyful. In the time beyond, yes, but also in the time here and the time now. And there, there is a message we can take to the world, a message that the people of the world are looking for, are pining for, are dying for. May they find that message and that hope in us and in the examples of our faith-filled and faithful lives. Let us pray. For your gift to us of the morning star, we give you thanks, O God. May it always be our beacon of hope and a promise that guides us forward this day and always. In Jesus' name, amen. In hands with one another, I'd like us to take a moment and give some affirmation to the newest member of our core of liturgists on her maiden run, Emily Rogers. not only competent and capable, but certainly improves the look of the scenery up here. <laughs> and now, if we would join our hands together, this physical reminder of our joining in Christ, our spiritual union, as we go forth to represent the morning star in the world where people are hungering and thirsting for the hope that God in Christ gives. And as we go, may we go knowing that the God who comes to us as creator, redeemer, and sustainer, will rule, rest, and abide with us this day and always. Amen. Mm -hmm.